So we're back again to have a look at the last portion of the life of King Joash. And as you can see, the title of this study is The Death of Jehoiada and the Apostasy of Joash and His Poetic Judgment. We ended our last study by looking at the, the graph of Judah's spiritual state and we saw that there was a recovery in the days of Joash because of the influence of Jehoiada. But you'll notice at the end of that little graph it starts to decline again. And that's because of what happens here uh, in the latter portion of 2 Chronicles 24 from verse 15 onwards. So we'll pick up the record from verse 15. But what we're going to read in verse 17 will take us back to verse 10. So just come back to verse 10 with me just to remind ourselves of what we read a little earlier. We read, and all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they had made an end. So the princes were prominent in the giving of the contributions for the temple. They rejoiced at the king's commandment, we read. They bowed to the enormous influence of Jehoiada, but they harboured secret desires for idolatry. And they were waiting. They were waiting until the old man died and was removed. And the hindrances to their real intentions uh, were removed. Sexual perversion motivated their apostasy, as you're going to see in a moment. And that's not, of course, unknown, is it, in the latter days. So this is a problem. It's been a problem for humanity ever since the times of the fall in Eden. They used flattery to achieve their objectives. That's not unknown either. Flattery can destroy good people. They closed their ears to appeals from Yahweh when he sent his prophets, rising early to send them. And they refused to acknowledge the divine intervention uh, that, uh, that, was, that was clearly there. So let's just follow this record down. And we're going to see these princes emerge in verse 17. Let's see verse 17. Now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them, and they left the house of Yahweh God of their fathers, and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. The word left there is the word azab. It means to relinquish. They relinquished the house of God, and they served groves. The word groves is asherah, means happy, from the idea of, you know, getting some kind of pleasure from from sexual perversion. That's, that's how you serve the Asherim. And the word there you see in verse 17 for idols uh, means an idolatrous image. So this is what happened to these princes. They were there just waiting for their opportunity. And the house of God was forsaken. Now, we might just go back and read from verse 15 and see how serious this is. Because in verse 15 we read, but Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. A hundred and thirty years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings. Now why would they do that? Well they did that because he effectively was king, wasn't he? You know where they buried Joash? It says at the end of this story that they buried him not amongst the kings. So here was the true king of Judah. It was Jehoiada. He buried him among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. Now, did you notice it said good in Israel? Yeah, and that's because, of course, we know that the nation now consisted of all the tribes because of the, because of the immigration from the north. We know that. But there's, it's wider than that because, you see, Israel, even though there was still the northern kingdom of Israel, Israel consisted of the whole land, didn't it, effectively, so you had Judah and the nation called Israel, but the Israel of God was the whole land, so to speak. And what it's telling us is this. You can be like Jehoiada. You can never leave the one place. All right? He never left the temple. He was always serving in it and have an enormous influence on the far reaches of the brotherhood. Get the point of that? He'd done good in Israel. Now today, of course, we've got technology. It's much easier. But in those days, it was word of mouth. And the reputation of Jehoiada and his influence went far and wide. And people would talk about that. And it influenced them. 
that there was a man who stood for what was right and he was immovable. See, that influenced them. So he'd done good in Israel. Never think that your work, even though you might never leave your own ecclesia, never think that your work doesn't have an impact upon others. It does. It filters out there in some way. Okay? And that's what happened here. So here is the house of God, which Jehoiada spent his life in. And now there was another man in that house who'd taken over from his father, and his name was Zechariah. And he's going to come head to head with his own cousin Joash, because Joash forsakes the house of God under the influence of the princes. So let's meet this man, Zechariah. Let's read on down. We read verse 17. We read verse 18, except for the last couple of lines. And it says in the last couple of lines of verse 18, And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. So they turned away to Asherim, and they turned away and made false gods, set them up in the temple, as it were, forsaking God's house as Jehoiada had repaired it. And then we read in verse 19, Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto Yahweh, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. So it wasn't just Zechariah that was raised up. He was the last. There were other prophets who came along and tried to get through to this people, to Joash and those that had turned away. But they wouldn't listen. So what happens in verse 20? And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people. And he said unto them, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of Yahweh? And there should be a little word put in here in the text, the word so, so that ye cannot prosper. Because there is, this, is, this is the outcome, isn't it? If you transgress against God, you're not going to prosper. It can't work, see? And that's the lesson that he's trying to get across to his people. Because ye have forsaken Yahweh, he also hath forsaken you. Now, hopefully we can remember one of our first studies here this week was in the life of King Asa in 2 Chronicles 15 verse 2. That was what was laid down by Azariah the prophet, remember, when he came and spoke to Asa on the way back from the enormous victory over Zerah the Ethiopian. He says, if ye seek Yahweh, you'll find him, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. That's the principle of 2 Chronicles 15 verse 2 coming out again. And Zechariah is reminding uh, his people of that. So we read of this man, Zechariah, that he was clothed with the Spirit of God. You see that word there, and the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah? In the, in the Hebrew, the word came upon is labesh. L-A-B-E-S-H. And it means, it means to wrap around, or by implication, to put on a garment. So this man is clothed with the Spirit of God. He's just like a spirit man in a way. In fact, when you look at the other translations, you've got Rotherham uses the word clothed. He was clothed with the Spirit. You've got the RSV. Uh, the Spirit took possession of him. Okay? So here you've got a spirit man. So he's raised up by God and the Spirit falls upon him. I think I know another man that the Spirit of God came upon. Uh, when he was baptised, remember, by John the Baptist as our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to find that Zechariah is a, is a marvellous type of Christ, one of the best types of Christ in the Old Testament, in my view, because of what happens here. Because this is all about the judgments that came upon God's people after they crucified their own Messiah. All right? This is the type set forth here of AD 70, the events of AD 70. So we're going to go through that now in this session. He's divinely raised up as a prophet in Judah. So he's a spirit man, raised up by God. He's the high priest elect, if not the high priest, and a son of David. Well, what was our Lord Jesus Christ? He was a son of David and the high priest elect, wasn't he? He wasn't high priest until he was immortalized. But so there he is, high priest elect. He was conspired against by the rulers of Judah. It's exactly what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. He pronounced Judah's doom and desolation of the temple. And that's one of the last things Christ did before they crucified him, as he stood in the temple and, of course, denounced it. And on, on the Mount of Olives, where we were the other day, as the disciples said to him, the two sets of brothers said to him, look at those glorious buildings over there, Lord. And he said, you know, 
You will not build. See one stone upon another when the judgments are finished, when the abomination of desolation stands in this place and the Roman armies come and sweep it away. Okay? So, same thing. Same thing that Zechariah did. Pronounced the doom and desolation of the temple because they had forsaken their God. He was slain unjustly by the leaders of Jewry, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. And he committed vengeance into the hands of Yahweh. All right? Again, he's, he's set forth as a remarkable type of Christ, is this man, Zechariah. He's got the, the, blood of, the blood of David's line in him, and he's got the blood of the priestly line in him. He's effectively a king priest. So then, we know, I think, that this is referred to in Matthew 23 and verse 35, but there are problems. So I want to deal with those problems, okay? Just because this is a matter that, that has never been really nailed down in our brotherhood because of the problems here. So we need to have a look at it. So I want you, if you would, just to, you might want to pop something into Second Chronicles 24 so you don't lose it. But come along to Matthew chapter 23. Now, this is where Christ is denouncing the Pharisees and the scribes and Sadducees and others of his day. And of course, he ends in Matthew 23, verse... Um, uh, verse uh, 38 Behold your house is left unto you desolate Okay, So this is exactly what was going to happen To the house of God in the days of Joash And we pick this record up from verse 34 Of Matthew 23 Wherefore behold I send unto you prophets And wise men and scribes Does that sound s s familiar to you? Yes I think we read that in 2 Chronicles 24 In verse 19 Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto Yahweh. See, So straight away you know where the Lord's mind is. It's back in 2 Chronicles 24. And there's a lot more evidence than that. He goes on to say in verse 34 of Matthew 23, And some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, <clears throat> that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Now, I read all of that because we want to work through this. All right? we, want to, we want to go through it in detail. The established facts are the only scriptural record of a Zechariah being slain in the temple is contained in 2 Chronicles 24, verses 20 to 22. The parallel account in Luke 11, 51 omits reference to Barachias. You don't read about Barachias in Luke 11, verse 51. Thirdly, Zechariah the son of Barachiah is the prophet Zechariah, of whom nothing is recorded concerning his death. Okay? We don't read about the prophet Zechariah who wrote the book Zechariah of being killed or stoned, do we? There's nothing. So there's con some confusion entered here. And there may well be an interpolation involved here because someone along the line assumed that it had to be a reference to the prophet Zechariah because Abel was the first prophet and Zechariah, apart from Malachi, because the prophesied at the same time, Zechariah was the last prophet. See, So they're thinking, well, there's the whole scope of Scripture from Abel to Zechariah. Well, they didn't think hard enough, as you're going to see. Some suggested solutions to this problem are that Josephus records that Zechariah the prophet was slain in the manner described in Matthew 23.35 according to Jewish tradition. You can't always rely upon Josephus, can you? And in one case, I don't think you can rely upon Josephus. Some commentators suggest Christ's words were a prophecy of the death by stoning in the temple court of a prophet named Zechariah 36 years later, recorded by Josephus in his wars. Well, it's not about that either. 
Other commentators suggest that Barachias is an interpolation by scribes who thought it impossible that Christ could have meant Zechariah the son of Jehoiada, who died some 800 years before his time and was succeeded by many prophets killed by the Jews in between. Okay? So they think, well, it can't be Zacharias, the son of Jehoiada, because he's, he's in the middle of the history, you know, not at the end of the history. Still others suggest that Barachias was a second name for Jehoiada, it being a Jewish practice to have two names. I think that's really probably, you know, uh, that's a long bow, that one. Okay. So there's some of the suggestions that have been made over time as to why we have Barachias in the record of, of Matthew 23 and not Jehoiada as being the father of this prophet Zechariah. Now, here are some reasons why the Lord is referring, I believe, to 2 Chronicles 24, verses 20 to 22. The omission of Barachias in the parallel record of Luke 11, 51, does lend some weight to the suggestion that it's an interpolation in Matthew 23. The Lord, however, draws heavily upon the context of 2 Chronicles 24. And to me, context is always the arbiter. At the end of the day, context is the arbiter of true interpretation. So when the Lord refers to this, he draws heavily on the account of 2 Chronicles 24 uh, when you read through Matthew 23 and Luke 11 very carefully. Zechariah, son of Jehoiada, is clearly a type of Christ. Compare the allusion in Matthew 23, verse 37, to which stood above the people. We see there verse 37, <clears throat> Matthew 23. It says in that verse, How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. So, you know, your chicken who's protecting her little chicks, they come under her wings and she's standing above them. She's protecting them. She's doing what she can for them. That's exactly what we read about Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada. In verse 20 of 2 Chronicles 24, it says, he stood above the people. Or as Rotherham puts it, he took his stand above the people. Okay, so like a chicken protecting her. He wanted to draw them back to himself. He's saying, look, come back to the house of God. And they wouldn't. Okay, so that's the imagery that is used. And I don't think there's any doubt there's a link there. Fourthly, you can compare the reference to stoning in Matthew 23, verse 37, and 2 Chronicles 24, 21. So why does Christ say in Matthew 23, verse 37, that they stoned some of them, right? Well, because that's what happened to Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada. He was stoned in the temple between the temple and the altar. So there's another little hint. Fifthly, almost conclusive evidence is found by comparing Luke 11, verse 51. So you might want to just have a third hand in Luke 11. If you can, you've got a third hand. In Luke 11, verse 51, which is the companion account, We'll just go back to verse 50. That the blood of all the prophets which were shed from the, <clears throat> from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. And that's an important phrase. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, see there's no father's name given here, <clears throat> which perished between the altar and the temple. There's only one prophet recorded being stoned between the temple and the altar. And Zechariah the son of Jehoiada. Then it says, Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Listen to the words of Zechariah just before he died. In 2 Chronicles 24 and verse 22, it says at the end of that verse, And when he died, he said, Yahweh, look upon it and require it. Okay, it's a direct quotation from the mouth of Jehoiada. So Christ is using the very words that came from the mouth of Jehoiada in Luke chapter 11. So I think that's conclusive proof that this is the man that's being referred to. So why then? Why then 
Were there other prophets that were killed after the after Jeho Jehoiada, the, sorry, Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, that has caused some people to think that it can't be him? Well, the fact that they don't recognise is that in the Hebrew Bible, the Bible that Christ and his apostles used, in the Hebrew Bible, Second Chronicles is the last book, all right? Not Malachi, not Zechariah. Second Chronicles is the last book of the Hebrew Bible. So if you're looking at the scope of the Bible from Genesis, the first prophet killed is Abel, killed by his brother, Cain. Okay? The last man recorded, killed as a prophet in the Word of God in the Hebrew Bible is Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada. Okay? So there is the whole scope of the Bible there. Okay? All the prophets from Abel to Zechariah are there. So that's why that is used. Now, point seven. The Syrian invasion in which Joash and the princes were destroyed was typical of the judgments on Judah in AD 70. And this is why Christ is using it. He sees a perfect type of himself in Zechariah and a perfect type of the times and the events of Joash's doom and end to his time when Jerusalem and the temple would be doomed by the Roman invasion in AD 70. A perfect match is made here. So let's consider that, shall we? Oops. So we've got the parable of the end of Judah's commonwealth in AD 70. Judah was an apostate ecclesia because of its leadership. Many prophets were sent by God. Verse 19 of 2 Chronicles 24. Finally, the great prophet, the high priest elect and of the house of David was sent by God and is slain by his own people, Jesus Christ. A Gentile army invades Judah to execute divine judgment. The guilty rulers are identified and slain. You know that the Romans are said to have isolated those that had said, you know, his blood be upon us, the ones that were still alive 40 years later, and put them up on crosses, right? which was just punishment, wasn't it? for their part in the murder of Christ. So they were, they were identified and slain. That's exactly what happens. Now if you come back with me to the record of 2 Chronicles 24, we're going to pick this up at verse 21. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of Yahweh. So there's your record of him dying between the temple and the altar. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, Yahweh, look upon it and require it. Okay. So what happens? Verse 23. And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against him and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people. Notice, they don't destroy the people. They destroy the... I wonder who told them to do that. I don't know. But it was the princes who misguided Joash. All right? It was the princes who came and made obeisance to him. They were the ones behind this apostasy. So they're, they're singled out. And so was he because he murdered his own cousin and showed no kindness. Okay, so the, the judgments are poetic. Beautifully poetic. And he sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. And the arm of, uh, army of the Syrians came with a small company, because God's behind this judgment. They don't need a big company. And Yahweh delivered a very great host into their hand, because they had forsaken Yahweh, God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. So here is what happened. And it's a type of what happened in AD 70. So now we get to this poetic justice that's going to be dealt out. You know, the one thing we know about our God is that he's always consistent, perfectly consistent in his judgments. If you acknowledge his righteousness, he's faithful and just to forgive. If you turn your back on him, he's got no option but to do what he did to Joash. He couldn't get this man to turn. He tried to get him to turn. He couldn't get him to turn. 
He sent prophet after prophet after prophet, and then he sent Zechariah, like sending his own son. This is what happened, isn't it? He sent his own son to his people and couldn't get him to turn. So what do you do then? Well, you send the army of the Gentiles to bring judgment upon them and their house. And that's what happens here. Okay. So where is he found? Let's have a look at what happens here in verse 25. And when they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases. Now, the RSV actually, I think, translates that better. It says... They, they left him sorely wounded. So he, he was incapacitated. They didn't kill him. They incapacitated him. Then it says, His own servants conspired against him for the blood. It says in the AV of the sons. It actually is singular in the Hebrew. It should read son. It's a reference to Zechariah. For the blood of the son of Jehoiada the priest and slew him on his bed, and he died, and they buried him in the city of David, but, not, but they buried him not in the sepulchres of the kings. And these are they that conspired against him, Zabad the son of Shimeath, an Ammonites. I want you to notice that it says an Ammonites. What does that mean? Well, it's a woman, isn't it? And Jehozabad, the son of Shimrath, a Moabitess. Now, how often do you read in the Word of God of the mother in a genealogy? You always read of the father, don't you? That this was the son of? Always. You never read of the mother, but you do here. So I wonder why. See, this is the curiosities that the Word of God offers up to us. And when you read something like that, you don't just pass over it. You've got to think, well, why? Well, why is this happening? And you get an answer, and it's a fabulous answer. You know, just, just wonderful. This exquisite poetic justice that is dealt out to Joash as a type of things to come, a type of the murder of Christ and the judgments brought upon God's people in AD 70. So where does he meet his end? In a bedroom. Where did he begin? In a bedroom, all right? He began in a bedroom, in the palace, 2 Chronicles 22, verse 11, six-month-old baby. There he was, totally dependent on others. He couldn't, I mean, six-month-old babies can't do anything for themselves, can they? So, totally dependent. He was saved by two women from certain death. Okay. Two women saved him. He was brought up and protected by his uncle and aunt in the temple. He was the only male survivor of David's house. Okay, so that's where his beginning was. And we're going to see the poetic justice. Where did he end? In a bedroom, in the palace, where he'd begun. He was sorely wounded, so that he was totally dependent on his family and his servants, just like Joash as a baby was. He was killed by the sons of two foreign women. He'd been saved by two women. He forsook and forgot his uncle's guidance and the temple. And he was judged because he killed his own cousin in the temple. Okay, so that's how he ended. It's poetic, very poetic. But there's more. These are the assassins. Second Chronicles 24 verse 26. Zabad, Shimeath, an Ammonites brought forth these people. Okay? An Ammonites and a Moabites. Jehoshabad, Shimrith. Don't need to go through the names. They're interesting, but they're not really important. What's important here is that they are the sons of two foreign women. What about these Ammonites and Moabites? Okay. As we've pointed out, this is very unusual in Scripture. Moabites and Ammonites were excluded from Israel in the law of Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 to 6. And why were they excluded? I want you to come back to Deuteronomy 23. Why were they excluded? It's one thing to be told that they were excluded. 
It's another to know why. God doesn't exclude people without reasons. So we come when we read verse 3 of Deuteronomy 23. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh even to their tenth generation. Shall they not enter into the congregation of Yahweh forever? Why? Well, the next verse explains. Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. Nevertheless, Yahweh thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but he... He turned the curse into a blessing because he loved thee. Thou should not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. So if you had to analyse that, what would you say was the problem? The problem was ingratitude and a lack of kindness. Now why ingratitude? Well, because you see, God said to Israel, the territory of Ammon and Moab is not yours. I gave that to Ammon and Moab. You'll pass through, but you're not going to touch, you're not going to take these territories, okay? Because I gave that to them. Did the Ammonites and Moabites appreciate that? That when God's people turned up on their doorstep, did they offer kindness to them? Did they show gratitude for the fact that God had given them their inheritance? No. That's exactly what happened with Joash. Come back to the record of 2 Chronicles 24 verse 22. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada, his father, had done to him. You know, the names are interesting here. Jehoiada means Yahweh knoweth. You know what Zechariah means? Yah hath remembered. Right? Yahweh knoweth. Yah hath remembered. Do you know what the name of the king was? that came up and sorely wounded him, that brought about all these events, it was Hazael. You know what his name means? God has seen. Look at the end of verse 22. And when Zechariah died, he said, Yahweh, look upon it. The Hebrew word is reah. It means to see. Yahweh, see and require it. So who does he send? God has seen. Poetic. Right. And there's two men, the sons of two foreign women, a Moabite and an Ammonite, that get involved in the death of Joash. They assassinate him. Well, this is where it gets exquisite. All right, very exquisite. Consider the origins of Moab and Ammon. Where did they come from? Well, we know where they came from. They came from the daughters of Lot. So when Lot was taken out of Sodom, his wife turned into a pillar of salt, he came to a cave, his daughters who were imbued with some of the attitudes and spirits of, of Sodom uh, thought that they were the only ones left in the world so they, they plied their father on two nights in, in a row with wine until he was uh, unable to, to know where he was and what he was doing and then both of them became pregnant to their father. It's a horrible story that ends Genesis 9. It's hideous, that story. But out of that came two sons, two boys, Moab and Ammon. Think about that. Why was Lot in this predicament in Genesis chapter 18 and 19? Well, he had forsaken his uncle and guide, just like Joash forsook his uncle Jehoiada and his guide. Okay. Lot had chosen another way of life. He got himself involved in the life of Sodom. That's what Joash and his princes did. It did not prosper, did it? And that's what we read. Yeah? Thou shalt not prosper. You cannot prosper. And it did not prosper for Lot. He lost his ecclesia and most of his family. His house was left desolate. That's what Zacharias said. Your house will be left to you desolate. Yes. And he ended up in a cave which became a bedroom with two women his daughters. Isn't that exqui exquisite? And he was made totally dependent on them, like Joash was. And incest produced Moab and Ammon. You can't get it much more precise, pristine. 
than that. That is the way God works. You can't play around with this God. He will, he will exercise his justice and it will be seen by everyone. And Joash is finally slain in the house of Milo, some of which you've, you've passed by, the house of Milo. In 2 Kings 12 and verse 20, we read of that. He's slain down here in a bedroom in the house of Milo, the palace of the king at that time. And Athaliah was slain a short distance away at the horse gate, right? not that far away. So this woman whom he had castigated for her corrupting influence in Judah met her end a short distance away from where he met his end because he went down the same path and forsook Yahweh his God. And this reformer sadly failed, terribly sadly failed. And along came another reformer a long time later who likened himself to Zechariah the son of Jehoiada. And he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. They conspired against him, it says of Zechariah, and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of Yahweh. I want to conclude on this note. There were two women involved again here in the death of Zechariah and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of them was Jehoshaphat. Remember? She was only 25, 26 years of age when she rescued Joash. So what would she be now, 47 years later? If you add 47 to 25, she's, she's getting on in years, towards the end of her life, maybe. She's still there, we believe. A sword pierced her heart. There's another woman who stood a distance away and then came up to the cross. The mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. She wouldn't have been of a much different age to Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, whose oath was Yahweh, is matched by Mary, whose oath was Yahweh. But Mary means bitterness, doesn't it? And the bitterness that overtook her as a sword pierced her heart it was like the sword that pierced the heart of Jehoshaphat who had saved this young boy from disaster and had saved the line of David from, distinction, from extinction. So you remember those two women. They're worth pondering in the background, but they're there in this, in this story of the tragedy of the end of Joash. So tomorrow, God willing, we'll finish our studies with two studies on the life and work of Uzziah, king of Judah, and we're going to see just how appropriate and applicable it is to where we are right now in the land of Israel and the people of God who are in their blindness and ignorance like Uzziah, in their pride and arrogance like Uzziah, king of Judah. And we're going to see a remarkable type there in the story of that man.